this and get it over with. Amen. Father, we just thank you that your word tells us that you are the Lord that heals. Lord, that nothing's impossible for you. And so, Lord, we gather together right now and we ask you, Lord, to deal with this coronavirus in our state and in our nation. Lord, I pray that it would just shrivel up and die in this entire world. Lord, that it would be evident that it's the prayers of, the, of your people. It's the hand of God. Lord, that it would just disappear and there would be no explanation. It would just be gone in the name of Jesus. Lord, that we can go forward and just see that great awakening, Lord, that we're so anticipating. Lord, that we can share the love and the life of Jesus personally and not have to worry about all these mandates. Lord, we just... Thank you for that, and we thank you for protecting our state and what you've done. Lord, I especially thank you that not one person from our, our church family has acquired that sickness. Lord, we thank you for that, your protecting hand. And Lord, we ask it in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Turn to Joshua chapter 24. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And today we're going we're gonna to begin our uh, series going into Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday is just two Sundays from today. And we're going to uh, do a short series along those lines. I love Pentecost Sunday because the church was birthed in Holy Spirit power. Amen? God never intended for the church to go forward and accomplish what He had planned Without Him empowering us and equipping us and enabling us to do all that He's called us to do. And we can't do it without Him, amen? We need His Holy Spirit's power. Well, today I want to talk to you about welcoming the Holy Spirit. We need to welcome the Holy Spirit, welcome God to have His way in our lives. And I want to look at a, a very powerful passage of Scripture it's one of my favorite in the Old Testament. You're all familiar with it, but Joshua is addressing the people. He's up in years. And he's making this great statement to the nation. Look at verse 14 in Joshua chapter 24. Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers serve on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. I want, I want you to first notice the second word in this verse, therefore. That ties what Joshua is asking of the people to everything that's in this chapter before. And specifically, he is tying it to um, different things that he has done, that God has done. Notice in uh, verse 3, when I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river and led him. Look in verse 4, to Isaac I gave. Verse 5, I also I sent Moses. Then verse 6, then I brought your fathers out of Egypt. Verse 8, and I brought you into the land. Then verse 11, at the very end, he says, but I delivered them into your hand. He's talking about all of their enemies. He's talking about, I gave you victories. Then verse 13, I have given you a land for which you did not labor. So Joshua is saying, I love this, he's saying, if you just look at God's grace and His blessing and His mercy in the past, then you will have a heart to serve Him sincere, sincerely in truth. Amen? And church, all of us could do that today. We could all look back and see the hand of God. Even if, if you're here today and you've never made a commitment to Jesus as Lord and Savior. If you stop and just ask God, Lord, remind me of where your hand was upon my life. God will begin to show you. And there's time after time in your life where God intervened and God blessed and if we see that, then it becomes so easy for us to say, yes, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Let's go on in verse 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, and the word evil there, the idea behind it in the Hebrew is, if it's a uh, 
a, a degrading type of way of life. In other words, it's, it's a way of life that isn't flourishing. It's, not, it's, it's a life that is just eating away instead. And that's, that's not what happens when we serve the Lord, is it? And then he goes on and says, Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Ammonites in whose land you dwell. So he's, he's listing the gods, the idols, in these past generations. And then he says, the gods right here, right now, that are in the land that you are tolerating, in a sense. Church, we still have idols in this world, and God has not called us to tolerate those idols, but to stand against those idols. Amen? And then I love this, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Is that your heart today? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is He who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who did the, the, those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites, who dwelt in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for He is our God. Church, in a very real sense, when we make that declaration, there is a spiritual dynamic that takes place. It's not just saying some nice words. It is saying that we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son. And that we are determined that He would influence our lives, that He would have His way, and that we don't want our way. We don't want the Spirit of the world, but we want the Spirit of the living God leading, guiding, and directing our lives and Him having His way. Amen? So in a very weird, real way, when we say that today... We say, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. We're saying, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in my life. You are welcome to guide me and direct me and to have your way. Lord, I want everything in my life to line up with you. Is that still your heart today? We've talked about this in the past, but the word house in the biblical sense is much more than a dwelling that we dwell in. Okios is the Greek word, and the, and the idea in the Greek is much broader than what we think. First of all, it has to do with you. When we say, as for me and my house, we're welcoming the Holy Spirit into our lives. We're saying, Lord, come and fill me up. Amen? And it's not something we do once, it's an attitude, a stance of our entire life. We say, Lord, afresh, every day, just, Lord, just I want a constant flow of your presence and your power and your glory in my life. Amen? How many like that idea? Lord, fill us up. Fill us up, Lord. The second thing it has to do with our, our home physically and our family that live with us, or our close family. So when we, when we say, as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord, we're not just saying each of us individually, we're also making a statement that, Lord, I welcome you into this physical dwelling, wherever it can be an apartment, it can be a lean-to, it can be a, a multi-million dollar mansion, it can be an apartment, it can be a home. It, it can be a tent out in the desert. It can be a cabin in the woods. But wherever we're dwelling, church, we're welcoming the Holy Spirit to come and to rule and to reign in that dwelling with us. And church, a lot of times I've, I've received calls where people say some strange things are going on in my home. What should I do? And I asked them, I said, well, have you dedicated your home to the Lord? Have you asked the Lord 
to, to cleanse your house. And those are things that we need to do. If there are people that have, have lived there before you, you don't know what they've done. You don't know what sin they've welcomed into that home. Even if you build a new home, the different various workers that are coming in, we don't know what they've done while they've been building, if they've you know, opened themselves up to sin. So we need to dedicate our home, our dwelling place, and then we're dedicating our family. Amen? The third thing, our vocation. When we make that declaration, we're welcoming God, not just in our, our dwelling place, our house, our, our, each of us as individuals, but the idea of house in the Greek also included your vocation, your job. And I don't know if you're like me, but I have always had a tendency and a desire to say, Holy Spirit, I need you on the workplace. You need to be praying for your boss. Or you need to be praying for your employees. If you have your own business, you invite the presence of God to be so powerful and present there. When people come into your business, they sense something different. They sense the peace of God, the, the rule of God in that place. That this territory is designated as God's territory, kingdom territory. Amen? Amen? And if you don't own the business and you work for somebody, you can still come and say, Lord, right here in my, at my desk or right here in my cubicle, whatever I do for this company, Lord, let there be evidence of your presence in my life. The fourth thing has to do with the influence or the circle of our impact. And all of us, church, all of us have an area of influence. You can either use your influence for good or you can use it for bad. And as when we make that declaration, it's for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Guess what? We are making a declaration. Lord, whoever comes into the realm of my influence, Lord, let them know Jesus is Lord of my life. That they would, they would sense your presence, your power, your glory. Now when we make this statement and we welcome the Holy Spirit, we are also welcoming Him to come in and do spring cleaning. We're in that time of year, aren't we? How many of you started your spring cleaning already? <laughs> you, you, you love to open up the windows and get the fresh air blowing through the house and you get out the broom and the mop and all the cleaning utensils and you just want to clean out the house. Well, it's interesting, but... In the Bible, we see where in Jewish tradition, they had a feast and called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And in sectors of Judaism, today, they still practice this feast. And the feast had to do with going into your home and removing all of the leaven. Now, leaven is yeast. It rises. It puffs up. And that's what sin does in our life. As the sin is welcomed in our life and we don't deal with that, it becomes puffed up. And we become kind of arrogant. It's my life. I'm going to do what I want to. Don't tell me that I shouldn't be doing this. Come on. I'm not getting too many witnesses out here today. All of us know that. And so when, when we... When we welcome the Holy Spirit to come in, when we make that declaration, it's for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're giving permission for the Lord to come and do spring cleaning. And all of us need that. And it's not just something we do once in a while. It's an attitude of the heart. As we make that declaration and we welcome the Holy Spirit, guess what, church? We should be welcoming Him to do that spring cleaning every day afresh. Amen? I want, I want to have you join me and look at three ways that we can welcome the Holy Spirit into our house. First of all, by dedicating our physical house. I, I mentioned that a moment ago, but I want to go a little deeper into that. When I, when I came to Summit about six years ago, I think within that first year, Maybe within the second, I'm not sure. But I, I looked at this passage of Scripture, and as we looked at this passage of Scripture, I had little 
rocks about this size, some were a little larger, some were a little smaller. But I had them all lined up across the, the platform, right on the edge. And each of those rocks had painted on it Joshua 2415. And at the end of the message, I invited everyone who wanted one to come and to take up one of those rocks and to take it home as a declaration that this verse is over my home. That I'm dedicating this house, this apartment, this tent, this condo, whatever it was, that I'm dedicating it to the Lord. That whoever walks up can see that rock. Some people put that rock right by the front door. Other people put it on their mantle in their home or on a, an, another special place. Today, I have a plaque that was made for me in Melinda, and it was made by the ladies at the Dream Center. And it has this verse spelled out on it. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a, it's a beautiful um, a little plaque about this long and about that wide. And I took it and I put it above the door of our home and I screwed it in. Now not everybody sees that, but I do. I know it's there. And I know that it's a continual declaration that this is kingdom territory. That I don't want to just live for Jesus myself, but my children and my grandchildren and all of my descendants. My prayer is that there would never be one of my descendants that wouldn't honor God with their life and that I would see them in heaven one day, no matter how long it is until Jesus returns. That's my prayer. That's my desire. So first we declare our physical house. In fact, in the Jewish tradition... Mezuzas are little small boxes about this long, about this wide, and they'll take scripture and they'll roll it up and they'll put it on those little boxes and they'll have it on the door. And it's easy, it's so small that a lot of times you'll pass by them and you won't see them. But they know they're there and it's a constant declaration. They're doing the same type thing. They're saying, this is kingdom territory. If you haven't done anything like that, church, I encourage you to do that. Because there is a spiritual dynamic that takes place. God honors our steps of faith. Amen? And when we're, when we're making that statement, we're saying, Devil, keep your hands off of what belongs to God. Amen? We're saying... I believe in the true and the living God and He is greater than all today. This is His home. We belong to Him. We welcome His presence and His glory to be manifested in our home. And devil, you have no business here. Amen? And we're saying whoever walks in to our home, whoever they are, whatever their business is being in our house, we want them to experience Jesus. We want them to encounter the presence of God and to know there's something different about this home. There's the peace of God ruling and reigning. Amen? A second way that you can welcome the Holy Spirit in your home, I want you to turn to Exodus with me. Exodus chapter 15. It says, You shall make... The breastplate of judgment, artistically woven, according to the workmanship of the ephod, you shall make it. Of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, you shall make it. Now the ephod is a kind of a, a sling that would go over your shoulders, and the breastplate would be attached to it. It would be for the, the high priest. And the high priest would enter in before God with the breastplate over his heart. I want you to remember that. Then look at verse 21. 
And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, each one with its own name. They shall be according to the twelve tribes. So they have twelve precious stones, and each one is inscribed with the name of one of the tribes of Israel. Now jump down to verse 29, still in Exodus 28. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. Notice, he shall bear the names over his heart. It's a picture of intercession. It's, and a lot of people don't understand this. Aaron was bringing the nation of Israel before the Lord. He was standing before God on their behalf. And all those names were on the breastplate over his heart. Church, we need to be interceders, intercessors, right? As priests, the Bible tells us in Revelation that we are priests unto our God, right? It was important for the high priest to come before the Lord. And notice, this was God commanding him to do this. This was all God orchestrated. It was his design. The idea was God's. The way it was done was God's. The names on the precious stone. Every one of them was precious to the Lord. Every one of them was significant to the Lord. And every one of them needed to be interceded for. God designed this and He called the high priest to do that. How many have ever noticed in the Bible that what the Bible talks about God's plan for this world is a lot different than what we're living in? Because man sinned, because Adam and Eve fell, sin, sickness entered into the world. This world is distorted because of it. But church, we have the privilege to invite God into our situation. Now some people think that, oh, well if God wants to do it, He's going to do it. Have you ever heard that? Well, if God wants a revival, He'll just do it. He doesn't need me. Every one of us is a free will. And we can choose to welcome the spirit of the world or we can choose to welcome the spirit of the living God into our lives. And God's called us to do that. So when we intercede, we are interceding for our children, for our family, for our friends. We're welcoming the Holy Spirit into our house. Amen? We're, 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 we're standing in the gap for others. And God wants us to do that. Church, if we're going to see a move of God in our, in our country, guess what? It's not going to happen unless the church rises up and we begin to intercede and say, Lord, we need a move of God. We're not going to see it in our families, in our homes, in our children's lives unless we're interceding. I intercede all the time for my children. I intercede for my grandchildren. With the way the things are going on in this world, I'm concerned if Jesus doesn't return soon, what my grandchildren will be living through. But at the same time, I know that God has determined our beginning and our end, the day that we'll be born and the day that we'll leave this earth. And God has placed us in the generation He wants us to be placed in. Amen? He knows that as we turn to Him, we have everything we need for whenever He establishes us in time. So I trust that, but I still intercede for the next generation. But there's something else I want us to see before we go on in this passage. There's something really powerful. Now in Revelation 5 and in 1 Peter chapter 2, it calls us priest. We are spiritually a priest. And not just the father in the home. All of us have that designation. So all of us are called to intercede, to stand in the gap. But notice something else. In, in the passage we just read, 
it had the, la- the, the name of the tribe on the precious stone, didn't it? Amen? It had the 12 tribes. That would be equivalent to our, la- our surname. Everybody, everybody what, what is your surname? Think about that for a minute. So we can take this even further than interceding for our children and our immediate family, our extended family, our house in that sense. And what the high priest was doing here was powerful. And we can do the same thing. And what that is, I want you to grab this. He was interceding like I would intercede for everyone in the world that has the surname Michener. And Melinda would be interceding for everyone in the world, but not just the Michners, we would also intercede for the Allens. I want you to think about that. It's taking our intercession to a, a greater, a broader way than ever before. And I want to challenge you, when you get up in the morning or you go to bed at night, whenever your little prayer time is with the Lord, I want to challenge you to begin to pray for those that you may have never met, but they are part, some way, of your family. Because I know a testimony, I had a a great mentor and pastor that his parents did this, and he and his wife did this. And God miraculously demonstrated to them and showed them what difference it made. In fact, he, he gives a, a, many different testimonies, but one in particular where a, a man came into town, had the same last surname, and just decided to call them up because the surname was rare. Like Michener's really rare. I think there's maybe one other person in, in, uh, in Alaska besides my immediate family. And he said they called him up and said, hey, I was traveling into town and I just went through the phone book and I like to do this, but he said, I found your name. And you have the same last name I do. And as they talked, something amazing began to unfold. That that man that had flown into town had recently given his heart and his life to Jesus Christ. (laughs) and and the pastor continued to share it happened with my mom and my dad numerous times that they would meet somebody with the last same last name and it wasn't just the father's last name they were praying for the mother's family descendants that that group as well so I want to challenge you, church, in in your time of intercession, say a quick prayer. Lord Jesus, I just bring all the Michners and Allens before you today around this world. Lord, I pray that they would have an opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that everyone that hears the gospel would receive that gospel. They would be born again. And that, Lord, I, I, I would see them in heaven gathered around the throne. Lord, I want heaven to be filled with Michners. I want heaven to be filled with Allens. And so, Lord, I'm standing in the gap for them, Lord. That's a powerful picture that's given to us. How many like that picture? Sometimes we limit ourselves. We limit our prayers. Our prayers are powerful according to God's Word. Amen? He hears. He answers prayers. But will we invite the Holy Spirit into our house, into these areas of our lives? Finally, the third thing, Matthew 18, 21 through 35. That's another passage of Scripture that everybody's familiar with. It's the parable of the unforgiving servant. One of the most powerful ways we can invite the Holy Spirit into our house is by living a life of forgiveness. Welcoming the Holy Spirit to enable us to forgive. One of the things I hear so often, but pastor, you don't know what they did. 
And then they proceed to want to tell me everything that person ever did to wrong them. In church, what does that do? It builds walls. It, it cuts them off from you. It separates you from them. And in this, in this parable, in verse 24 of Matthew 18, it says, And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to, brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Today that would be equivalent to like $100 million dollars. It was a number that was so extravagant, there's no way the servant could ever come close to paying that amount. And church, that's a picture of you and I and our account with God. Our sin has, has accumulated such a great debt that there's no way that we can ever pay God back for the debt that we owe Him because of our sin. That's why we need Jesus. I said, that's why we need Jesus. <laughs> Jesus paid the debt that we could never pay. We could work all of our lives in this, this illustration here like the servant and never come close to paying that debt. You and I can never ever pay the debt owed God for our sin. But Jesus did. <laughs> Jesus paid the debt. And when we receive that, receive Him into our life, welcome Him, that debt is pay, has been paid, and we receive the benefits of knowing Jesus and being right with God the Father. Amen? Now in this illustration, jump down to verse... 27, then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. That's what God does in our lives because of Jesus. But look at verse 28. But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. That's like three months wages. Now that's a big debt, but it's not an impossible debt. Amen? Amen? It would be possible to pay off that debt. But notice what happens. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. When we don't forgive others, when God has forgiven us of so great a debt, it's just like that servant. We're just coming up and grabbing them by the throat and say, pay me what you owe me. And God says, I forgave you of so much more. You need to forgive them. Amen? In verse 32, it says, Then the master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all, the de all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? So the answer, church, is that we should forgive. And I know that many times it's not easy to forgive. We've been wounded many times over and over and over. But church, if we say it's for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're welcoming the Holy Spirit into every area of our lives to enable us to do what God has called us to do. Amen? And one of the places, one of the areas where I've seen unforgiveness stronger than any other area, it's in families. Families can take advantage of you. They can do you wrong. They can steal from you. They can manipulate you. They can lie about you. They can stab you in the back. Families hurt one another. Why? Because we're sinful. We're not perfect. But church, 
the Holy Spirit will bring healing to that hurt. And He will enable you to forgive that hurt. He will enable you to drop those walls. Now I'm not saying, church, that you just drop those walls, run over and hug them and say everything's fine. If they're a person that continues to hurt you, it's okay to keep them at arm's length. And be, you know, have boundaries around you. I'm not saying you can't do that. But I'm saying we must forgive. Amen? I want the worship team to come and I want you to stand with me. This is one of the most sobering verses in this conclusion of this story. In verse 34 it says, And his master was angry and delivered him to the tortures until he should pay all that was due to him. Church, if we live a life of unforgiveness, we're welcoming the torturing of the enemy into our lives. We are. We're being disobedient to God. We're disobeying what He's called us to do. And so, when we do that, we're welcoming the enemy to have a hold, to come in, to have that torture. Church, today it's a very simple message. Like I said in the beginning, this is one of my favorite Old Testament passages. I love Joshua because he led Israel into victory after victory after victory. He called them on the carpet. He said, get the idols out of your life. And he didn't do it in, in, a, in a brutal, angry way trying to get even with them. He did it out of a heart of love. As the leader of the nation, he had a heart for the people. Amen? And he said, I don't know what you're going to do, but let me tell you, it's for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And I want you to make that declaration with me today. And when you make that declaration, I don't want you to do it flippantly. I don't want you to make that declaration just because you hear other people in the auditorium making that declaration. If you say that with, with me today, I want you to mean it in sincerity. I want you to, to say, Lord, I'm inviting you into every area of my life and my home, my family, my immediately fa family, Lord, even my friends that I influence, my job. Lord, I'm inviting you into it all. Amen. And Lord, today we're drawing the boundary lines and the enemy's going to see those boundary lines. You can't touch our family. God is our King and our Lord and our Savior. Amen? It's kingdom territory, so take your hands off of what belongs to God. And when we make that declaration as we come into this house, we're making it for our church family as well. Amen. Wherever I've pastored through the years, I always prayed that the church would be healthy. That the church would join me in pursuing God with all their heart. That they would join me in making a declaration is for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And when we do that corporately, there is a spiritual dynamic as well. When people come to visit our church, I pray they would encounter Jesus like never before. I'm praying that they would come in and people would be healed. People would be saved. People would be set free of the garbage that wants to master their lives. Amen? That they would have a God encounter. It's not just about coming and joining and fellowshipping and, and singing some songs. Yes, we come and we're going to praise and we're going to worship God. But it's about encountering Him, church. If we want people to encounter God. So I want you to join me. And on three, we're all going to make that statement together. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, okay?
One, two, three. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Father, I just thank you today. And Lord, if there's anyone in this building that's never made that commitment to you, I pray that they would make that commitment today. Lord, if they've never opened their heart as an individual, Lord, they may be watching on the live stream. Lord, I just pray right now that they would open their heart to Jesus. They would welcome you in to cleanse them, to heal them, to make them whole. And Lord, wherever they're living at this moment, Lord, it could be a shack in the woods, but that house is going to be filled with the glory of God. It could be a mansion that is elaborately filled with expensive artwork and possessions. But that family is realizing right now that all that doesn't matter. That what makes a home what God wants it to be is when the leadership in that home and all I want to speak not only to the fathers today but many of our homes are single parent homes. If you're a mom and you're raising your kids you are the priest of that home. And you need to make this declaration over your family. And I want you to know, many of, many of you have been hurt and wounded and, and, and by a, a, your husband. And maybe he's gone now and he, he's not having much to do with you or the kids. I want to tell you, there is a man that loves you and cares about your family. And his name is Jesus. And He will never leave you and never forsake you. He is your provider. He is your protector. He's everything that you need. So right now, I want you to just open your heart to the Lord if you haven't. I want you to welcome the Holy Spirit to enable you to begin to intercede for your kids and your family, or, and if you're single, to intercede for your, your mom and dad or your brothers and sisters, your aunts and your uncles, your friends, those at work. But make that declaration over every area of your life. Holy Spirit, you're welcome. As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Lord, let not... That, that scripture be just something that we just recite. But Lord, let us mean it with all of our heart today. And I ask it in Jesus' mighty name.